There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Welcome to another Word in Your Attic and to an old pal of ours from Word magazine, a key member of the team back in the day, <laughs> former editor of, of uh, Select and <laughs> Q and Mixbag, and now a tireless and, and virtually one-man podcast factory. It's the excellent Andrew Harrison. Hello, Andrew. Mark. Hello, Mark and Dave. How are you? We're, We're all right. right. It's How just like where, being where back in you? the Word office. It's exactly <laughs> yes. like the years have fallen away. Here we are again in cramped small environments covered in promotional rubbish. <laughs> That's right. Arguing about the, 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 the relative merits of the Beatles. You used to take exactly. a tremendously good uh, 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 position, which was that the Beatles were rubbish. Just to, <laughs> just to wind everybody up, I think. No, no, I no. no. I don't point know. Of, no, point, of, point of order. I never said the Beatles were rubbish. I just said I was sick of the Beatles. You said you were sick of Only them. a fool would say the Beatles were rubbish. No, that's true. You can have too much of one thing. And I, I thought... Go on. <laughs> I was recalling prior to this one of my there, there were there were many witticisms that flew across the word office, as there were in all magazine offices back in the day. But actually, my favourite was we were overnight one night clearing an issue or whatever, and we just had to wait for colour proofs to come back. And it must have been four or five o'clock in the morning. I remember this. And people yeah. just sitting there, grey and tired, and wanted to go home and so forth. And Andrew was, was sitting looking at his laptop. And after a while, he snapped down the lid and said, well, I read the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I had as well. There wasn't a lot of it in those days. There was only so much. It still makes me laugh. That was the night we invented that game about uh, the television programme. Tom Waits, wasn't it? Kind of oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bohemian sits patiently looking at his watch, you know, that kind of thing, wasn't yeah. it? You know. Yeah, Nobby Styles, hairdresser. Yeah. That's <laughs> Was. Great Roy time. Rogers, etc. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, for on the on the Triple X channel, Babe Station. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we should now, Andrew. We, as you know, traditionally we transport people back to uh, the place where they grew up. In your case, Liverpool, I think was it. And you, can you remember the the equipment, the record playing equipment in the family home, and what might have been on it? The record playing equipment in the family home. Yeah. Uh, my dad had a. Uh, it was a cassette deck and it was what was the bloody make it was i can't remember the make but it was a it was a kind of beige and orange setup um which to my amazement when i went to visit old colleague of ours adam higginbotham yeah. uh, in new york we now he had the same one he bought the same one so i had a major kind of proust thing but it was a cassette deck um and, and such an early cassette deck that do you remember tapes used to have the speed on the spine one and a quarter inches or one and three quarter inches you could change the you, oh, wow. which uh the 33 78 45 of cassettes oh, and he had cool. a panoply of john denver tapes <laughs> albums of john denver all of which were the same songs in a different order yes they would so i could teach morrissey a thing or two about uh, sweating the assets so <laughs> it was just but um, so my dad used to play an awful lot of john denver um grandma's <laughs> for the bed and his song um but also, um, the other big music head in our family was my granddad, my maternal uh, grandfather, Bob, who was basically like exactly like me, except instead of Acid House, it was Old Jazz and the Mills Brothers. So he oh, had, really what everybody, what the viewers can see here, Dave's room is basically my granddad's room, except it was all the Mills Brothers and the Ink Spots and, oh, uh, you know, Joe Lost and tons and tons Wonderful. of comedy records. Spike Jones. Oh, well, yeah. you know, um, all that kind of thing. Spike Jones, uh, you know, with her, with her head tucked underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower. Yes. We love this when we were kids because because bloody was a rude word. You see, yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So all, all that. So he was he was a music man. Out. My dad was a my dad. My dad having less leisure time running the butcher shops, which is a long. It's an early start and a late finish. So the only time he got to listen to music would be Saturday afternoon, or sorry, Sunday afternoon because he was working Saturdays. Sunday afternoon when he was doing the stock. So he'd go into the back room with all the week stock records. <laughs> stick on John Denver and da, 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 da. but things evolved because it was me and then two brothers, Ari and who's now the He's new editor of Mojo yeah. and Al Stewart, the, the, the middle brother, 
all of whom had step. We were at the top of the house, three rooms next to each other, all with stereos on, all blasting at the same time. Downstairs, my dad blasting John Denver and my mother at the bottom of the stairs, screaming at the top that this would be like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, time to go to school, work, screaming up the stairs. Is anybody bothering today? Is anybody bothering? She did actually once turn off the electricity to the entire house. just <laughs> From uh, me, my brothers and my dad. And we all squealed, obviously, because that would ruin the records because the needle stops. And obviously <laughs> yeah. that was that was the setup. Can you remember the first record you bought with your own money? The first record I bought with my own money was Get It by The Amazing Darts. You better get it while you can. Uh, oh, 63p, right. I think. Uh, I love darts. And actually, weirdly enough, you know, the, the early things that you, you tend to forget, I realised that darts have got more in common with the bands I went on to love than I thought. Darts and madness, not that different. You know, a weird kind of Ted aficionado thing. But also music for dancing too. Yeah. That's what uh, I really So like. reminders of darts. So darts this is Den darts. Hegarty. Rita Ray, Ray, Ray and Rita Den, Ray, Hegarty. Den Hegarty. And the other ones. Um, there was like 12, 13, 14 of them. Um, and there were do what bands. I remember Danny Baker spent a night in jail with darts when, when I was at the NME. <laughs> I can't remember what happened. Yes, they, were, they all got a bit out of hand. They literally thrown in a cell overnight. He says one of the best yeah. nights of his life. I mean, if you're going to be, be in, yeah, a, well, in a jail cell, you might as well be in there with Dan Hegarty. Well, I was imagining, I, I, I would imagine it would be something like a scene in a kind of uh, exploitation movie, the late 1950s, where suddenly all the cons start singing like this. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's darts. The first, the first record that ever came to my possession was. Hang on, uh, where's it gone? I've only, I've only got it on CD, but this was on tape. Hang on. Uh, where are you? Come out, come out. Getting a lovely view of your drinks cabinet while you're up there. There oh, you yeah. go. So oh, that's right. Slade. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sladest. Is that on Sladest? That Sladest. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, by yeah. Slade, which was the I heard that on cassette, and the cassette has gone somewhere. So that is my, that's my rosebud. But I got it on CD again. It's still fantastic. But yeah, where were you hearing stuff? Were you listening to radio programs and reading pop magazines or anything at that time? Or where, no, where were you getting? As a kid, I first got into. I, I first started paying attention at all when I was sort of six or seven through, because the top of the pops. I barely knew that radio existed. So it was just top of the pops, and everybody just everybody watched top of the pops, as you know, as anybody watching this knows. Yeah, yeah. everybody, and. You know, I think my earliest memories are two things. One is David Bowie doing Space Odyssey on top of the pops and the other are the sea devils emerging from the sea and Doctor Who. <laughs> and in my mind, it was all the same thing because yeah. David Bowie's World of Aliens and, you know, John Pertwee, Doctor Who with his frock coat and all of the outfits and, and, and all of the, you know, the way aliens looked in those days. I, I sort of couldn't tell the difference. It all seemed to be, it's the world of the telly. That's what happens in the world of the telly. David Bowie's in Space Oddity, and then the Sea Devils come, and then we go to space, and then the suite turn up, and then Slater on, and it all seemed to be the same thing. <laughs> They're all part of the and, same family. And nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you buy records? Can you remember? I used to buy records. I was, uh, I'm, a, I'm a terrible cheapskate. I used to buy them in cheap and Rumbelows and Woolies in right. the goal because I worked out very quickly. You see this cat. I worked out very quickly that um, if you bought it the week after it came out, it was about 50p cheaper because it would go to 10p. So I have a huge quantity of uh, cheapy box singles. But as I got older, I used to go to Probe in Liverpool, actually, where where you would be served by Pete Burns in his full gear. Pete Burns didn't Pete Burns didn't do civvies. He only had one outfit and he looked like Pete Burns. And it was terrifying to go in and and, and, uh, <laughs> and ask for anything at all because Pete Burns' disapproval could melt the wallpaper. And I remember going in and buying... Did he make I, that abundantly clear then, if you, if you didn't he like it? He just him? was just... It's a permanent sneer. Um, I don't know what I don't know what would meet with his approval, but I remember going and buying a record by the Beat, and that sort of uh, got sort of moderate nod. And, mm, all right, because the Beat and Two Tone and the Specials were the, the you know you you start off liking these, but then you have a thing that's your thing, and the Two Tone yeah. became my thing. Yeah, but yeah, yeah um, so it's that. Uh, but also, you know, like Liverpool was blessed with record shops. There's you know, Chevron, Chevron Records, and and uh, you know we had a we had an enormous HMV. It was just. I, I, you know, I used to go record shopping, you know, twice a week if I could. Spend all my money that I didn't have. Were you, of, was that, a big were you of that generation where you couldn't go past a record shop? You just had to wander in and just look, 
looking yeah. at the bags. Yeah, uh, you had to go in and to see what was happening and and um, and what was around. But but also more than anything, be terrified of missing anything because I mean I used, yeah. to hate go- yeah. I used to hate going on holiday with the family because there'd be a two whole weeks where you went in a record shop and you might miss things. You might never be able to get them again yeah, because true. there was no such thing as an old record. And then, uh, then of course, we discovered record fairs, which is incredible, and you can buy old records. But, um, yeah, I remember, can you hear this cat on the soundtrack pairing? This is Giblet the cat, isn't This is Giblet the cat, yes. Um, so, yeah, I would kind of, you know, go on holiday and be seized with nervousness and terror for the whole two weeks in Perrinporth that I'm going to miss something. And you come out of a madness spot record out and you can't get the picture disc now because they're all sold out. Because <laughs> you're on a beach. <laughs> it's terrible. So you know, this was a very big deal, wasn't it? I mean, you were always talking about and in fact interviewing Madness several times. I think yeah. you, were, you were at words. But they were a big deal. And was there a favorite member of Madness? I mean, uh... oh how can you do that, Mark? That's terrible. No, uh, I have great fondness for all that. of them. I yeah. did actually I did actually see Mark Bedford walking across Stoke Newington um uh green about a fortnight ago i blurted out without really knowing i love you man <laughs> like, and he went what but um no I, I i think um i i had a great fondness for Chaz because Chaz was the what well, i think they used to call him old no ears because he couldn't initially couldn't play anything he was the dancer and yeah. yet was still in there so i had a fondness for Chaz. also looked great um I loved all of them. I thought that they were they were like the Bash Street Kids. They were a gang. Everybody had a gimmick. Everybody looked different. They, and actually, I realised this is what a lot of what I like about groups. Subsequently, Pulp became one of my favourite bands, and they too looked like the Bash Street Kids. They looked yeah. like, looked like a cartoon drawing of a band. All human life. But yeah, a big tall one, a little little short one. Yeah, a, yeah. A girl, you know, a, a wide one, a kind of thing. The guy at the front, he looked strange. So yeah, I mean, that, that, the kind of cartoon aspect of it really, really appealed to me. I'm not much of a one, as you know, Mark. I'm not much of a one for social realist rock. I don't no, like absolutely. people in flannel jumpers. <laughs> that kind of thing. Fair enough, you're forgiven. <laughs> so the yeah, thing, the thing about madness was there was a great sense of event, wasn't there? About a new madness record yeah. because they always had a new video and a new a video. The videos were incredible, and the okay. artwork, the, 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 the people the swinging from cranes, brilliant. Yeah. yeah, and every single every single bit of artwork was a, they'd done a new way of doing something with the fact that there were seven of them. It would be like a geographical arrangement of their faces, or a you know, uh, you know, a kind of melding of them, or they, you know, be in this, or they look like an Andy Warhol print. But it was like they, yeah. they were a logo. In fact, we loved the whole family, all, all three of us. We loved Madness so much that we actually reenacted the cover of Night Boat to Cairo. You know, where they're all stacked on top of each other. Yes. We did that with, we did that with my granddad at the bottom. We still got that picture lying around somewhere because, because the great thing about those days was granddads had access to Madness hats. And now I subsequently realised that, that Madness wore them because they were getting them off their own granddads. But you know, Trilby's. Yeah, so we could you could, make a, say, you could cool. denude your grandfather's wardrobe of trilbies and old suits, and look like madness. I'm trying to remember when Lee Thompson appeared on the cover of Smash Hits. Mark, you remember this? I think Eric took the picture. They had. He was, the, they had he was wearing. On the, they all had a le- letters. Yeah, they? the letter they hats. Was it an E or was it an it was an E? Yeah, because that's one of the beautiful e. things okay. about madness is okay. there were seven letters in the word madness. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, so each one had a hat with an M and an A and a D. And he was E, wasn't he? He, he was. Right. And I know this because I saw it only the other day in an issue of Word magazine where the covers of Smash Hits have been reproduced. And it's that cover. And Lee's got a clown's red nose on. Yes, because there was also oh, wow. there was a, 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 an awful lot of Samuel Beckett in madness as well. Eventually, it kind of it, it eventuated from them. It, it, you know, it, it was both the kind of both the, the carnival playground end of comedy, but also the kind of weirder, stranger, more kind of middle European, which reaches, of course, it's apotheosis in the album The Liberty of Norton Folgate. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. No, that's a, what a great record. <laughs> Fantastic. My goodness. Also, they were very exciting as a, as a teenager, weren't they, those records? Because they were kind of naughty. They're about yeah. real life and bad behavior and also poignant and sad as well. Yeah, but yeah. They were, they were in recognizable. In a very upbeat way. You know? Yeah. They were, well, my, my favorite Madness song is a, is a song called Disappear, which is off Absolutely. Uh, it's kind of Mike Barson piano driven thing. And it's just about knocking around at the fair. Um, and knowing in the back of your mind that you're not going to be doing this forever. Yeah. And that one day it'll all be gone. Um, but you're a kid, so you don't fully understand that. But actually you do. And it's the it's absolute, you know, breaks your heart every time you hear it because it's all about what it was like when you were 13 or 12. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Knowing that, that you're not going to be 12 forever. So you never formed a group yourself. No, I can't carry a tune in a bucket and I can't play anything. 
so I had to become a music Hasn't journalist. Stopped a lot of people. Were. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that. I don't know anything about music, so I had to become a music journalist. So you never even performed in any kind of no. uh, I d- I d- in, in a jazz smash capacity with when, a bunch when of I, not, not in any way whatsoever. When uh, when I did Trevor Horn for the word, and I said to, I, I said to him that I didn't know what a key was. He looked at me in abject horror. This guy has been <laughs> judging my records for thirty years, and he doesn't know what a key is. And no, I never performed in any way. I did, I was briefly nominally manager of my mate's band, the Melting Polar Bears, but they didn't have any instruments or songs, so it didn't really <laughs> didn't really go very far. Perfect. They just decided, you know, like you know, like uh, like the Crucial Three when uh, Wiley and Julian Cope and Ian McCulloch said we're a band now. We're the Crucial Three. And they didn't have any songs or instruments, but which were a band. It was like that. But they're still yeah. talked about fondly, aren't they? They are talked about, yeah. Waiting yeah. for the crucial three. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was, that you... was the, full, the full extent of my involvement in the music. Although I did, I did a little light A and R in Liverpool, which went you did, absolutely. Didn't you nowhere. write for the Liverpool? I can remember the Liverpool yeah, Echo. I used to uh, post or somebody. Yeah. I used to. I used to. Uh, I used to do gig reviews for the Daily Post in Liverpool and the Liverpool Echo. Who did you review? Brilliant. The first, uh, the, the standout is I was the first person to review the Lars and uh, spot them as a potential thing. Yeah. Everything else was kind of just it was just local bands, but also uh, if anybody you know if anybody was on tour. And, uh, you know, just uh, I would do it because nobody else wanted to, which is incredible, really. But the, as you know, in those days, being into music at all was uh, for weirdos and for people who just didn't really have, um, you know, that it, it, was, it was just off to the left. It wasn't. Yeah, it was. And they would tend to give it to somebody who said, right, they'll take care of the music and they can just do whatever they want. We'll believe yeah. it's the right thing. So consequently, you could get all kinds of nonsense in there. I think I, I, I did review Half Man, Half Biscuit for the Daily Post, which um, <laughs> Southport Art Centre. And uh, I don't know. The, but the mad, the mad thing was you had to file your copy on the phone and it had to be in by quarter to ten or it would miss the edition. Yeah. So I'm standing there pumping two peas into a reeking <laughs> telephone box next to the Royal Court in Liverpool going, no, the Jesus and Mary chain, not Jesus and the Mary chain, the <laughs> Jesus and Mary chain point paragraph. Um, and the copy takers at the echo on the post were, um, they were, they were, they were a funny bunch. They were, uh, you know, they, for some reason, I don't know whether this is true of copy takers everywhere, very camp bunch of lads with a great sense of humor. Right. And they would just they would they would always make mock of my reviews and make mock of uh, this ridiculous music I was talking about. So, can you remember first seeing your name in print and your feelings? Uh, first seeing my name in print, well, that would have been um, that might have been the Echo actually. No, it was no, it would have been the Daily Post. It would because that was the right. first time I got a proper byline anywhere. I'd been doing. I used to do summers with my uncle, my my late uncle uh, Lewis, uh, who passed away last year. He, he was like my mentor and he had a press agency in Liverpool oh, right. and I would go in and make the tea and, and sort of graduated to writing darts reports for the port news <laughs> um, and things like that, where there's so little going on in the, in the port news that um, we, we, we were really creative with events, shall I say? Um, I think I might've got a byline there. I don't know, but I think the first one, it would have been, would have been the daily post for, for some gig review or other. Right. Um, and it just, um, it's just a very mad feeling of, of uh, you've arrived here. It's a um, very strange feeling. Very strange feeling. And then, I, you know, obviously within six months, you say, I was with the rest of the stuff, you know. Yeah. You look very blasé. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> think you're sophisticated. Where was the first band you saw? Can you remember? The first band I saw yeah, I was The game. Beat. Well, actually, no, technically speaking, the first band I saw was a band called The Mood Elevators, who was supporting The Beat. Yeah. Um, it, it was The Mood Elevators, The Bell Stars and The Beat. And um, this is a Royal Court in Liverpool. Let me get rid of this cat. <laughs> Bell Stars, good value. Yeah, they were they, because they just um, they just left the Body Snatchers, um, and um, I'd, I'd become more pop. Well, the first band was the Mood Elevators, which I can't remember an awful lot about. They were signed to the Beach label, but the first headline band was the Beat on their What Happened tour, um, and I'd never heard anything so loud. It, I couldn't believe it was legal for something to be that loud. And obviously, probably by today's standards, it would probably be quite quiet. But the Royal Court was where I saw almost everybody. The Royal Court, fantastic theatre. Saw the specials there. Saw, you know, the uh, New Order, the Fall and the Smiths thing, where they raised money for uh, Liverpool City Council. Um, God, everything from that to, like, Level 42. It was it was just brilliant. And um, there's a... Um, there's a there's a little bit of extras video extras on uh, the last Iron Man film where um, Ben Kingsley is playing this he's playing this actor called Trevor Slattery 
who's who's uh, he's he's a fake supervillain. But they do a kind of a flashback, and there's a picture of little Trevor outside the royal court in Liverpool, where he got the acting bug, darling. And I, my heart sang. It's like you know, there's there's Sir Ben Kingsley supposedly outside the royal court. Royal court was fantastic. Right, right. So you you went to Leeds University. Yes, I did. And you, you started. You wrote there, didn't you? Yeah. Oh I God, to... lead student. I can remember the lead the... student. Lots of people. Jay Rayner. I'm trying to remember who's on it now. Adam. Jay... Yeah, Jay Rayner, Adam Higginbotham, Andy Pemberton, future editor of Key Magazine, uh, Kamal Ahmed, future news director of the BBC and yeah. business correspondent of the BBC. Hey, yeah, well, so loads of people. But uh, loads of people who just went on to um, to do journalism. I think we'd all gone there because of the lead student paper because it had a reputation as being a really good one. Yeah, and so uh, I'd I'd sort of you know done my I'd done my year well I'd done my gap year working for my uncle in the press agency and just like get a few bylines here and there and then off to Leeds primarily for the paper um did a lot of work on the paper uh but also did a lot of freelancing and I, I did I, who can you remember the kind of any well there was one band who we will not name because it would be cruel one medium level indie band uh, were interviewed by me and Andy Pemberton at the same time. And they were extremely high-handed and off-hand and very full of themselves. This is a band who'd had one top 30 hit. And they didn't know that they were in that they were talking to two future editors of Q magazine <laughs> who, if they had been nice to us, we would have put them in the in reception slot where you know the in reception slot was like you've got a bit of a panic on ring up one of your favorite bands they can have half a page yeah, yeah if they yeah. if they'd been nice to us oh you've got to give us some hints or yeah come yeah. on no come no no on. no because i don't like to kick a band when it's down and this band is down you know what i mean but they, they you know there's a there's a moral there for all of us but yeah but, i mean this was like you know in leeds at the time um age of chance were the hot and coming thing so they you know they were always there and i loved age of chance with their mad artwork and their um you know, attempts to do Yorkshire hip hop. I did. I mean, this is a little bit afterwards. I did Nightmares on Wax. He was brilliant. George from Nightmares on Wax. Yeah. Um, you know, it was uh, <laughs> the, the 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 best of the lot, though. Of course, is when we got the call going um, uh, from a PR called uh, Anton Brooks, Mark. That you oh, yeah. remember? Well, yeah. I had no idea who this was. Um, I've got a band in town. I've got, I've got a show coming in town. Tad and Nirvana. Tad and Nirvana. Do you want to interview them? And I just never heard of them. Not interested. No, get lost. We're, we're, we're more excited about what's happening with the Inspiral Carpet. Yeah, Who is Tad Nirvana? I've never heard of him. And so <laughs> I, we knocked back Nirvana. So we, and then those are the days when Nirvana, when they were on tour, would probably come and keep on your couch because they were penniless or, yeah. and then become your yeah. best friend forever. And you would, you know, then you would have the inside track. And oh, we, we, now we blow it out because um, I then had a full bowl head baggy, you know, Billy Anfield, uh, rave doing was not interested in guitar music because guitars were on the way out mark um, <laughs> and uh, as you may have heard this once or twice so yeah so i blew out tad and nirvana i've lost the news no that's good god i can remember that i remember working with you in select magazine and you and various pals saying that that you you know that, that yeah the guitars were all over and you didn't you didn't be right one day listen to <laughs> eventually you didn't consciously listen to records with guitars on in fact you you, you actively avoided them yeah, I'm being horrified. Bad for you. But then look at yeah. a British Sea Party shirt. They're in guitar. Fans. I, know, I know. You can't be. Uh, you, you can't be held. Well, I thought party. of the other day because the Tan Hill Pub, highest pub in Britain, was yes. snowed in, and I can remember you going there and writing a piece about them because they were playing. Yeah, it yeah. was brilliant. We were. Yeah, we got we got uh, snowed in with British Sea Party in the Tan Hill Pub where it was so cold that the sheep were coming into the pub for the warm. <laughs> so we were sitting there with, having a pint with a sheep under your legs, just like <laughs> hiding under your legs. And there were chickens that lived in the pub. And it was just, it was fantastic. It was, you know, the highest pub in England. And uh, we, 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 we decided that um, this was the basis for, a, for an unwritten George Orwell book, Animal Pub. <laughs> Four pints good, two pints bad. <laughs> so are you are you a hoarder of uh of old stuff of, i don't know of what do you think what well, do you I think Dave? well yeah are you uh, yeah, go on are, are you yes okay so you, you <laughs> hang on to things do you you think you know found, you know because now's your opportunity to, oh, okay all right i i hold on to things um yeah stuff migrates in here this is uh this you know a lot of this stuff used to be scattered around the house uh, and bit by bit, through no involvement of my wife, I'm absolutely sure it's just doing it by itself. It wanders into this room and gets stuffed on shelves. It disappears oh. from the mantelpiece and ends up in here. I've no idea how it does it. 
some yeah. kind of process of osmosis i think she just wants the room cleared out no i collect the, I, I just keep stuff i don't like getting rid of things i mean i don't think i'll ever play this cassette version of vic reeves i will cure you ever again but i can't bear to to let go of it um <laughs> you know similarly i've got welcome to the pleasure dome on multiple formats but i can't get rid of the cassette either um it's just this it's like it is your archive of memory though isn't it have it's you listened stuff. to that recently pleasure dome yeah yeah it had right. some really good. I mean, well, it's got three fantastic tracks on it. I just wondered. I wondered if it sounded dated. I've no idea. It's, really. it, it, the, 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 it does sound a bit dated, but in a good way because yeah. that version of dated is now very contemporary. Yeah. Um, a lot of the uh, the young people I now work with in the podcasting business will say, "Put this on the office stereo," and I'll say, "This sounds like Sonia. This sounds like the Reynolds Girls. This this sounds this sounds like Taylor Dane's Tell It to My Heart." And I know this is the sound of now. So, um, you know the. The wheel turns and it's, it's a pleasure dome still sounds pretty good actually sounds hugely enormously brilliant well it, you know in terms of not getting rid of stuff um it is it, it all you know it all performs a gigantic mnemonic function doesn't it it kind of reminds you of what you were doing and who you, who you were and also can remind you of very very um uh, useful things so I, I sort of think you know getting i mean i just i just have boxed up the entire collection of selects to go into the storage room in in liverpool because we are literally running out of space here um, but you know, you've still got them all. I've still got them all. I mean, mint condition. Look at that. Still in the plastic. Oh, Remember that well, one? Well, yes. Free, free fly posters. Well, too. viewers, a big moment though, but, because Andrew Harrison pretty much invented the, the the concept of Britpop. There it is with the with the Union Jack. There you go. Oh, well, you know, I'm the, Bertie from Swade, as we used Bertie to Bertie from Swade. Yeah, that, he's now forgiven me for that. Um, that was Andrew Collins's idea to put the Swade in front of the Union Jack. That was kind of it's like as a moments of, of uh provocateurism oh, right. but um yeah no I, I i do i do keep stuff and i've just i've just dug out from under the bed the seven inch box just just because to, that hasn't oh, been out from under the bed yeah, go on, let's see ages hang on this fantastic thing the madness the later period single oh, i pronounce you know i was gonna ask you about this box. Now they were called briefly called the Madness. Weren't it was they? illegal. It was, wasn't wasn't yeah. Mike Barson? Didn't Mike Barson leave or something like that? Isn't that so what happened? Was that's what they looked like when they were the Madness? Because this is a box with with, with free stuff in it, all kinds of free stuff. I think I think I've lost the uh, the badge, but it had the single "I Pronounce You" plus um, the world's tiniest poster. Oh right, seven inch. Um, but no, what happened was they they nominally split up. Well, what really happened was I think they they just uh, you know basically didn't want to work with Bedders or um, yeah Velocity Enamel Badge didn't want to work with um, Bedders or Woody anymore, which made me a bit sad because you know they were supposed to be the gang. So there's yeah. four of them: Lee, Chris, um, uh, Carl, and Suggs. Bed, uh, Mike Barson had left years ago to go and meditate. And in, had to change their names so. to get rid of them. So they didn't well, didn't he, I don't know, I think, didn't I think he marry a Dutch woman? Didn't he? Yeah, he, he, did in Holland. he still he does, I think. Yeah, yeah, really? he's back in the band now. He still lives, lives in Holland. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it was a case they had to change the name to get rid of them. I think they they were they had loads and loads of names. They were going to call themselves the Wasp Factory originally, uh, after the Ian Banks book, Ian and Banks. then they just decided to call themselves the Madness. So that's one thing that's in here. Um, I'm gutted that I've lost that badge. I'll try and tear the house apart now and find it. But there's all kinds of I can things see you're a bit thrown by that. Yeah. Um, what else? Hang on. Um, <laughs> Dudley and Cream's Cry. All oh, right. Wow. The skids into the valley, kept perfect, carefully preserved in plastic. It's oh, I've got that. Yeah, I've got that uh, in a bag. Yeah, I mean, um, low. Basically, the entire Madness catalogue and most of Two Tone on seven inch. Um, perhaps got a brand new pig bag. Oh, that's Does, a great record. You know, it's um, yeah. And somewhere in here, our ground all the time. Somewhere in here is a copy of Competition by the Rabbi Joseph Gordon, which is a secret identity of Julian Cope. An incredibly, incredibly rare record. Very hard to find. And I found two copies for 20p in the HMV in Liverpool and bought them both. And one of them is in here and another one has mysteriously disappeared. So I'll be having a word with R.A. and R.S. about that to find out what's <laughs> happened to this other copy. And the reply I can predict is, well, you, you had one already. You don't need the other one. <laughs> and I'm thinking somewhere in this room, I was, I was trying to see if I could put my hand on it because you are the only person in the world who, who probably doesn't have it, will be quite impressed by it. Is I have a ZTD a ZTT um, duffel bag. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. <laughs> Huge, love great thing. Do you ever go out with that, Dave? 
No, I tell you what it is. Do you remember? Probably, well, is it time of the first Frankie album? It probably is. Mm. They did a complete range of um, they did. Stocks, Socks. didn't they? Yeah. Socks, Socks underpants, bags, hats, whatever. T-shirt. Boxes. And uh, for promotional purposes, they sent a set of this stuff out to people like me. That's and worth a fortune. That's got to be worth a fortune. It's worth a talk about Presumably, that. I'm imagining, Dave, unworn. He's going to go and get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I should have, I, if it belongs to Dave, it's definitely unworn. I can't imagine, I can't imagine him putting on a pair of, uh, of Frankie boxes. He's not, gonna, he's, he's not going to put his Frankie boxes on to go and see Crowded House, is he? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, that's not Dave drag. It's not really. That's not yeah. Dave's hot look. No, but, God, that would no, be worth some money, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. And it had uh, this is where Frankie's design team, XL, invented the emoji. Because remember, they had the little man doing that. Yeah, there they are. There they are. The emoji. That's right. God, I had that too. Now, what have yeah, I done? Yeah, the cross with it? the heart. What do I still top? have? Good Lord, Dave. It's God. all there. That's fantastic. That's, uh, is there anything in there? No, I think so. Just some fluff. Just the bag. Some That's... Basing Street fluff. Oh, hang on That's a here we go. What's this? No, Dear just... Dave, thanks for all the support. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't have made it without you. No, Paul that's... Morley, big, big long thank you note with quotes from Baudelaire in it. <laughs> Paul Morley. <laughs> yeah. and, um... Dave, I'm writing to thank you and I'm thanking you for thanking me for thanking you. And I'm returning and I'm going and I'm coming back again. Love Paul Morley. <laughs> <laughs> Will this do? So there you are. There you are. That's fantastic. And I'm so jealous because th- when that came out. I'll let you have it, Andrew, next time I'll see you. That's really good. Dave, I don't know I'll, what to I'll, say. I should carry it with me. God. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Meet me in the station on the one with the ZTT bag. <laughs> Any other cool. choice promotional items? They are extraordinary. Oh, Dave and I found all well, sorts of things, haven't we? You know, choice... Reckless Eric Brick, you know. But you've got. Well, I did have. I was, when I was editing Q in the early early 2000s, I was given a. Remember when you 2 did that album? Where on the front of it they were all at an airport with with luggage. Oh, yeah, yeah. All, all that you all can't you leave, behind. leave behind. As yeah, well, like yeah. That, yeah. Unexpected album in the bagging area or something. It was called. And they, they <laughs> gave right. us um, they gave us trolley. Uh, they gave us they gave us the 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 um the trolley. Uh, the, the 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 luggage with a U two little leather thing, and you know U two never really my cup of tea. But I wasn't going to look a fantastic piece of luggage in the mouth, so I used it until it fell to absolutely shattered pieces. And now this thing is worth like a grand or something. So if I just put it in the loft, I'd be laughing. However, I did keep. Where has it gone? I've still um, got a Simply Red bag, I have to yeah, say. There you go. It's, it's yeah. I've still got the Simply U2 Blue. Do you remember that? Yeah, you got one too. It's rather gorgeous. I don't know if you can actually see the embossing on there. There's the U, that's, that's the U2 all that you can't leave behind. Oh, passport right, well, holder. Oh, there you go. Well, just about. Yeah. I'm trying to get it in the light so you can see the embossing. Yeah, so, you know, that's useful. But again, I mean, I can't say I'm a fan. Um most of the bands I like are too much like bloody cheeks gates to do anything fantastically opulent like that. They're all too poor. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I have got, obviously, the uh, a selection of the Pet Shop Boys Christmas cards. Oh, oh yeah. My favourite band. This year's Pet Shop Boys Christmas, I know band, yeah. Christmas yeah. card. Aurora Borealis. 20 years ago. Stop the Iraq War, say the Pet Shop Boys. Wow. Yes format with all bits of their different sleeves uh, arranged as cards so i've got them all in here somewhere i need to organize it actually they did a fantastic one one year when it was do you remember when it was the look for very when they had the kind of helmets on yeah the orange and the, the yellow and blue helmets and the pointy you know so the christmas card one year was was just a mask and you could put it on and you too could have the um you could have the uh, and i thought hang on no no that was a promotional mask the card itself was that but instead of the helmet it was a christmas cake <laughs> a big Christmas pudding, no, like I've in got the Beano. These two, they put so much so thought the... and effort into it, don't they? Yeah. Well, it's this is the. I mean, without being, you know, Mister Boring talking about the, the digital era, this is the big chunk that's been lost, isn't it? The the presence of the physical thing that yeah, is that, that. like a totem and an objet d'art, and this is why people buy vinyl, isn't it? Really, they don't play it that much because you always get a download card. They buy it because it is an objet d'art. Yeah. A thing to hold in your hands. Oh, and, yeah, and um, read the sleeve notes while you're listening yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, Dave's in front of his huge pile of records there. I've got all my CDs here. You're able to look at your memory and you're able to sort of, uh, like I was saying earlier, you, know, you can, it's, it triggers things. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I was thinking that's the great tragedy of the, uh, of the internet that you have this endless supply behind this tiny little window. Yeah into it you know what i mean whereas in the old days you used to be able to walk among it exactly that's why yeah. you went in a record shop 
was yeah. to just be surrounded by the stuff. Yeah, it? it's like Have trying to go th- into a library. It's like it's like trying to access a library through a letterbox. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. And also the paralysis of choice because I mean, the, yeah. Uh, 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 yes, you sit down, you turn on Spotify. I'm going to listen to some music. What should I listen to? And then your mind goes blank. And then you just fall back on the thing that you always listen to. So yeah, Whereas if you went into a record shop, you were limited by what was physically there, which was wonderful, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, all they've got, so we've got to make a decision. You yeah, know. driven driven to things. And and um, and also, you know, by, by strange sort of outlying factors, like me making myself go to the cheapy box every single day because I'm yeah. a cheap person. But, <laughs> you know, I, I picked up a copy of The Neighbours Theme by Bonjo Iabingi Noah, a... Adrian Sherwood affiliated reggae person and this is a fantastic version of a not very good song which I will get on the very rare occasions when I DJ out I will play it and people really love it and that was like 25p in the cheapy yeah. box at Crash Records in Leeds yeah. so just making you get you're making yourself go to places that you wouldn't ordinarily go yeah you've discovered things that you, you used to anyway so yeah. from, an algorithm. From, where, from where you live now which yeah. is uh, uh, Stoke Newton isn't it how far do you have to go to find a record shop? Well, I don't really go to record shops that much. No, anymore. but if That's you did, if you did, if you if did, I did, how uh, far would you have to go? Um, I could pro- probably about a mile into Dalston. There are record shops okay. there um, because Dalston is. I mean, it's, it's yeah, in, in a different. way I'm not representative because I'm right on the edge of yeah. limited edition seven inch dum, and <laughs> in a, I, my album's only on cassette dum, so. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, under other circumstances, I, I should imagine we quite far. We, we had a fantastic um, record shop in Stoke Newington called Totem, um, and it went down the pan. Um, yeah, I mean, there are more secondhand record shops than there are new record shops, aren't there? Because yeah, Flashback, yeah, records, will, yeah. Flashback yeah. records in North London is is, is really good. Um, no, it's just amazing to think back to the days when they were on every corner. That's the thing. You well, have to pinch yourself to be reminded of this. And yeah. unlike, I mean, you can you can see physical architectural evidence of how there used to be a pub on every corner because yeah. every corner yeah, looks yeah. like a pub. It, you know, yeah. you, look at it, you go, hang on, yeah, that used to be a pub. Yeah. That yeah. betting shop, that house, it used to be a pub. But it's hard to see the record shop that used to be a record shop. They've sort of disappeared. and um, But they've been replaced, I think, by an equally good record shop, which is the Super Connoisseur you know, hard to find one. I think the thing that is, seems to have resurged a little bit that is a bit depressing is the is the the exclusionary record shop Otair. You know, like who are you and what you're doing here? The Pete Burns to hate. you're talking about, the Pete Burns character. Pete Burns was comparatively welcoming compared to some of the people <laughs> I dealt with in the world of in the world of electronic dance music who would literally go take it, you, you <coughs> present the record and they take it off you and go, no, you're not having that. We're saving it for saving it for the DJs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which is, you know, and I mean, the, the word, the, I mean, the, the, I think the best record shop I ever went to, the one I loved the most was Crash in Leeds. The guy that ran it was a guy called Chuck Hussain, who was in a band called The Hollow Men, and he's a big deal in Leeds music. And I still talk to him on Facebook. And it was, it was fantastic because he, he, um, he, he treated it like a, like a pharmacist. I would go in and I'd say, well, what have good. you got? What, so what did you say? All right, here's what you need this you want that you want this yeah. you want that no you don't want that you want this instead and he would basically when i was when i was when i was in leeds i would go record shopping every day i would go I would make the rounds from crash by the university to jumbo in the marion center right the way down finish up in hmv um by having bought you know i mean i remember i remember going into jumbo in the marion center um pushing open the door because I, I didn't i didn't really know the guys by name but they knew me as a regular customer and i said open the door and the guy behind the counter went you come here you want this and handed me three feet high and rising by dale soul and i said what is it i've no idea what it is he said shut up buy it go home and play it so i did and it was three feet high and rising and we we all know what a fantastic record that was but it was really nice to be you know and I, you know the, the only place that's like that for me now is I wonder what it was about you that made him think you were the right person for the, or is he doing it to everybody? Yeah, uh, well, probably he, very he effective to everybody, but also sales. Yeah. Because I was in, yeah, partly it's because I was in there every day, but also partly it was probably because I had a bowlhead haircut, a big, long, floppy hooded jacket with flowers all over the front of it, uh, gigantic flares, and I was, you know, lopping around and Perry in the sketch where they discovered Oasis. So he probably <laughs> looked at me and went, 
I certainly recognise him, but basically the haircut says he wants this yeah, record, so there you yeah. go. <laughs> and, you know, really astute. He was right. Don't remember very often any of those guys telling me a clunker. No, so, no. Very you know, know your customer. No, it's funny that business you're saying about the uh, the kind of the, the person behind the counter who always wants to look down on you. I was telling Mark uh, recently I went in a, in a jazz shop and I was looking for a... <laughs> Did you looking, say got me jazz? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was looking for a Sonny Rollins record, and I went through everything. You know, and I've worked in record shops, and I know my way around record shops, so I can usually find things in record shops, you know. But I couldn't find a Sonny Rollins section. I couldn't find him in Artist's Head or whatever. And I go to the guy behind the counter, and it's not a big record shop at all. I said, sorry, I mean, maybe it been being a bit thick, but can you tell me where the Sonny Rollins record are? records are? goes, avant-garde and they're like oh my <laughs> god i know and it's the idea that you should have figured that out yourself which is so ridiculous <laughs> that terrible snobbery i still think the jack black character in high fidelity is fantastic you remember him he won't sell the captain beef up be uh, bootleg that day because it just doesn't feel like it i haven't seen it but oh you've never seen it they, uh, I, I mean I, I do remember the bit in, in in the ray of film human traffic though where the guy's giving him the hard sell on this record was made by crackheads. You've got to buy it. It was, you know, you've, this is like hardcore. Yeah, 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 rap, yeah. That kind of thing. But the kind of, the whole, the whole theater of the record show um, is very enjoyable. And the fact that it was a physical search into the pits and the depths, the probe in Liverpool. I had no idea how far back physically it went into the building. It was like, um, it was like, di- it was like dimensionally incomprehensible. It just seemed to have rooms and rooms and rooms like the TARDIS. And <laughs> and I never really found the back of it. I never found the end of it. It just went on and on and on. And there's, there's a kind of the, the sense of personal discovery of, phys- of <coughs> physically going on a journey somewhere yeah. is a bit more interesting than following link after link after link after link. There are, is. There's lots to be said for SoundCloud and there's lots to be said for Bandcamp and there's lots to be said for the fact that we can now... If you want to share a record with somebody, you can literally just send it to them immediately. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you can, and you can, you know, uh, I was then, also an inventor at tape maker. I used to like making home tapes to the extent that it, in a pinch, because we were stuck for a cover, we actually got Bobby Gillespie to make a tape for us, didn't we? Yeah. That was, the, that sold really well. It sold really well. I think I still got the tape here, a copy of the tape. Sorry, the called the Solid on. Vibes Rock Tape or something. Wasn't you, it? Hold on. Is it here? Oh, what? Hang on. Cat out the way again. Go. Get out the way. So I've got Enemy Dancing Master. Yeah. Select Factory Tape. Oh, yeah. When we did cover mounted cassettes. And can you see the, read the spine? No. Can't go on. Read, read it out. Go on. It, uh, it says rock and roll music in Bobby Gillespie's handwriting. Bobby Gillespie's uh, tape. So Scott that's Scott. the one that was very good. Yeah. Wow. Dutch S by Scott Walker. Wait and see by Lee. That's Hazel. right. I'm trying to remember what was on it. It was all quite gothic, wasn't it? Uh, inevitably. Yeah. Uh, Am I grooving you by Freddie Scott? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good record. Feel the need in me. Rock your baby. New star by uh, Tapa uh, Zuki, or is that new star by Freddie Scott? I can't tell. Bobby's handwriting is, is indistinct. Yeah. So all kinds of stuff here, and uh, and the cassette that teaches you French for some reason. I don't know. So. So you've answered my question. Do you hoard things? Yes, you clearly <laughs> yes, you do. do. We haven't it's even started on the comics yet. If you're looking for anything, it's clearly at Andrew Harrison's house. Absolutely. I am a one-man junk shop. <laughs> so, Andrew, what is the greatest record ever made, then? I'm glad you asked Because you that, clearly please. know the answer to that. I have it to hand here somewhere. <laughs> I think uh, I know what it's going to be, actually. Do you? I'm going to see if I'm right. Yeah. Are you gonna, all right. So tell me what it's going to be, Mark. Well, I think it's right. Norton Folgate by The Madness. No, it's not. By the madness. It's left to my own devices by the Pet Shop Boys. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Feature on the cover, featuring them messing around with some devices, as you can see. Oh, that's right. With some bits of wire and plugs. But no, it's left to my own devices, which is not only is it the a day in the life of uh, dancing electronic dance music, not only has it got <laughs> opera on it, not only is it ridiculously over the top and yet somehow small and intimate. It's very funny. Che Guevara and Debussy to a disco yes, beat. to a disco beat. It's, it's eight and a half minutes long and feels like about two. Um, 
It's got sa- it's got the opera singer Sally Bradshaw singing House House, and I went to see the Pet Shop Boys do a thing with an orchestra at uh, the Mermaid Theatre in uh, two thousand and something. Who wrote that? And the party afterwards. Um, Sally Bradshaw's husband was running around unplugging all the speakers because it was so loud and it was going to destroy Sally Bradshaw's ability to sing. Also, at that live show, they did um, they did It's All Right, the cover Sterling Void cover house record. And they finished the song and Neil goes, oh, that's an old rave classic. And I go, yeah, feeling that the entire room is going to cheer like mad. And the only, there's only one voice in the room that cheers, it's me going, yeah. <laughs> So that's so on the live album, you can hear one little voice going, Yeah, and that's you. me. So I'm on a Pet Shop Boys record. Um, you go. Great, great. There and, you go. And they, they, all, they all looked at me like I was an idiot. But yeah, this is it. <laughs> Left to my own devices. I probably would. I, it's well, just... it, it's a good choice, Andrew. And it being Very Andrew good. Harrison, you get a review with it as well. You there see, you he's just. Mouth on a stick. You get a featurette actually <laughs> to, to accompany it. It's, it the record is, it, itself is, is not sufficient. Andrew, it's been lovely to talk that to you. That was a lot of fun. It's been a pleasure, Chuck. Very colourful and very like, funny. Great. We were worried like we would never get days. a word out of you because we know how, <laughs> you know. We know it's just like the good old days. Now, can we talk about the flat plan, really? Because I think we need to like, shift a few <laughs> things around. <laughs> Terrible holes open up on page three. Yeah. And we because, go to press in 25 minutes. <laughs> we're dropping the George Harrison 28 pager and we're putting in 2000 AD and Doctor Who special, right? <laughs> Coming out. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.